As you might know, if you've been here for the past couple of weeks, we are in a series where we are talking about the parables of Jesus, right? The parables of Jesus. And I love, I love the parables of Jesus because Jesus was a master teacher. Amen? We can all agree about this, right? And he used stories to illustrate um, some of the most profound teachings that, that exist, not just then, but existed, exist to today and speak to us sometimes more today than they did back then right? Uh, did you know that there's a part of your brain that's actually wired to remember stories? Yeah, it's true. There's a part of your brain that is wired and like created, designed to remember stories, right? It's almost as if like Jesus knew that, <laughs> right? It's as if like that was part of the, the plan all along, you know? Um, there's a, yeah, we, we remember stories, uh, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I, and, and the, the best kind of stories are ones that you only never, ever need to be told once, right? And you remember it. You know, like th there's that old joke. Um, it says, why is six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> For those of you whose a little bit of your soul just died, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize this morning. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's funny because, right, we, it's a, it tells a little joke that tells a small story, right? Parables are just stories that Jesus is using to illustrate this greater message. And so Jesus, uh, here we're going to focus in on the parable of the talents. Who's ever heard the parable of the talents or read the parable of the talents before? Yeah, amen, good. It, you're only in church for so long until you hear it, right? And if we're not careful as like the modern day Western church, we can get kind of caught up in this idea that this parable is about we need to do better right? That's the general idea that comes along, like, hey, like, there's a master, he gave, like, three of his servants different, like, amounts of money according to their abilities, and, and, you know, two did really good with it, and the other one didn't do so good with it, and he was punished, right? And if we're not careful, we get in this mindset that, like, God's sitting there and be like, better work, right? But that's not the picture that, that is painted here. That's the picture we can perceive if we're not careful. Amen? Um, so we're going we're gonna to hop right in here. And just so you know, this, uh, well, actually, we're going to start right in your um, handouts. Who has their handouts with them? You got your, your little handouts? Awesome. Do you like following along your handouts? Awesome. Amen. Listen, I feel confident about these handouts this time. Sometimes I make these handouts, and I'm like, don't even worry about them, you know. <laughs> Use them to start a fire. It's fine, you know. <laughs> now, I feel good about these ones, okay. I feel good. I put in a little bit. I, I, put, I did the work. Um, my mom, who's an English teacher, would be proud. Uh, she is. She, just, she was at first service. So, um, so your first fill in here, right? Number one, point one. All the parables Jesus tells from Matthew chapter 24 through to chapter 26 focus on the various relationships God has with humanity. Those are your first two fill-ins. The various relationships God has with humanity, right? Humanity as a whole. And just so you know, uh, this section, right, that, that section from Matthew 24 through to chapter 26, it's called the Olivet Discourse. Isn't that kind of a neat little nugget for you, right? It's called the Olivet Discourse. And it's Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and he's sharing like six, there's three main parables, but there's like really six parables that he's sharing in this, this discourse. He's, it's just him and his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and um, he is about to go from here to the Last Supper, like at sundown. Like this is, this is like one of his last teachings. This is his last teaching prior to the cross. Right? Jesus is sharing his, to his disciples. And just like uh, Pastor Jim and Pastor Ralph mentioned over the past couple weeks, right, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to take these kind of parables and translate it to us here today. Because if Jesus was speaking it to his disciples, he's speaking to you and I as his disciples. Amen? Right? We are following after Jesus. Therefore, he's speaking these to us. All right, your second point you're filling there, okay, the parable of the talents— Jesus uses our relationship with money to reveal the perceptions we have, here's your fill-ins, of ourselves, our purpose, and our Lord. It reveals the perceptions we have of ourselves, our purpose, and our Lord. Because let's face it, we have a relationship with money. Amen? Amen. We do. Sometimes we don't want to admit to it, but we do. We all have a relationship with money. Right, like I have here, um, I have here my good friend Ben. Right, 
Ben, just so you know, listen, it's rare that I have Benjamin and me hang out. It's just rare, okay? Gab and I, ever since we did like our Dave Ramsey class about like money, financial management, like we're on the envelope system, we work really hard, you know, if ever I, I, me and Ben get to hang out, I try to spend as much time with Ben, you know? <laughs> me and him, we hang, like I, he stays with me, you know? It's a little, it's a, it might be a one-sided relationship, like I don't let him go anywhere, you know? Like, he's really, he's just there. He's the kind of friend that's there for emergencies, you know? I do everything I can. Like, I'm that guy when you're waiting in line at Wawa to, like, get your coffee. I'm that guy trying to measure out, like, $2.17 in cash, you know, without trying to get change back because I don't want to have to break. Especially if you've ever broken, a do- like, a $100 bill over, like, like, 40 cents. It's the worst feeling in the world. Even, like, the cashier's like, I'm so sorry. If I had 40 cents, I would have I done something, right? Because we all have a relationship with Ben. We do. We all have a relationship with money. And we know that we have a relationship with money because when something happens to our money, it affects us emotionally. (laughs) We don't say amen to that, but it's true, right? Amen? (laughs) Right? It affects us emotionally. Um, That's something that only a relationship can do, right? Like, if I took just the corner here and I was like, oh, did that hurt? No, something doesn't hurt because we can, a nice good piece of tape, we can just, we can get that back together. That's okay. You know, but like, it begs the question, like, when does a dollar stop being a dollar, right? I mean, we know inflation and all that kind of stuff. I mean, like, when does it stop being worth a hundred dollars, you know? Like, how close can we, sorry, that scared me. I didn't mean to, you know, like, when does it stop being valuable? Does that hurt? I don't know about you, it hurts me. This is why we did this after we received an offering for the Lord. <laughs> it's okay. You know why? Do you know why it's okay? Because I'm fighting inflation. Okay, listen, some of you are really worried. It's fake money. It's fake, okay? <laughs> Everybody breathe. Everybody breathe. Here you go. Listen. Finance guy, here you go. Just so you know. All right, this is, I like your shirt, we match, yeah, you guys, we match, you go, yeah, definitely, right? It's just, fa- it's fake money, it's not real, it's, I like, got it on Amazon, everybody take a deep breath, I know, okay. I wouldn't, do, like I said, me and Ben have a real, that, that's the fake Ben, okay? Those are the fake Benjamins, they say copy on them, I promise, they came from Amazon. Don't you try to use those, okay, that's illegal. Um, Right, it's, 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 but we, let's be real, like there was, a, why did you laugh? Because there was a sense of relief, right? <laughs> Pastor Nate's not just throwing hundreds into the shredder. Pastor Nate's not trying to fight inflation. No, it's, um, <laughs> right, it, we, we, we have a relationship with money. What happens to it hurts us if we lose it and makes us happy if we get it, right? Jesus is taking this reality that has been around since the beginning of humanity, since been, been around since the beginning of time, right, when it comes to value and wealth, and he's using it to tell a story, right? That's where this picks up. Because the moment we start talking about the parable of the talents, we recognize, I mean, who many of us know that the talent, a talent is not like you can play the keys and some people sing unlike me. Or, or, I mean, hopefully you sing better than me. Right? Nobody's ever asked me to be on the worship team. Um, right? Like there's, we have talents and abilities, each of us, that are different. That's true, but a talent here that Jesus is talking about is a sum of money. Right? It's, a, it's an amount. It's, a, it's, a, it's like it can be either a single coin in some suggestions. Other people say it's a bag of silver. Um, but either way, no matter how you look at it, a talent, um, and this is uh, your next fill in here, fill in number three. Each talent that we're about to talk about, ready? It's worth approximately $1.5 million. <laughs> With an M. <laughs> million dollars, $1.5 million is the, the, what the parable of the talent is talking about. Each talent that is referenced here is a huge amount of money. I don't know about you, but that's... It's a, it's a big deal. <laughs> Sorry, I, t- I choked on nothing thinking about it. Okay, that's why, like I said, I'm on the envelope system. Okay, so we're going to pick up here. We're going to kind of go through this and, and just kind of break it down verse by verse. So you with me, church? Yes. Amen. All right, so 
We're starting off in Matthew 25, verse 14. We're looking at just these 16 verses, and we're going to break these down together. Okay, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents. If you're doing the math, if you're a math guy, that's approximately $7.5 million. <laughs> okay, not a small investment. Uh, the first he gave five talents. To another, he gave two, three million dollars, and to another, one, one and a half million dollars, conservatively, okay? Keep that in mind, right? And he went away on a far journey. And it's good for us. Let's pause right here. Now, remember, like I said, this is the, the Olivet Discourse, the number of parables Jesus is talking about here. It starts off with his, his disciples saying, Jesus, tell us what it's going to be like when you establish your kingdom, this is what it's going to be like. So Jesus shares these parables, and they're really not meant to be segmented and written and, and, and read on their own. They're meant to be read together, right? Because they, they breathe into each other. They lead into each other, right? The, 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 this parable rhymes with, matches with a parable he just shared just a few verses earlier, right? So we're taking this right now. We're looking at this, but we understand that Jesus is talking about his coming kingdom, what his kingdom is going to be like, right? At where are we at? And it's talking to us right now where we are, we believe in God. We're trusting the Lord until he establishes his kingdom on the earth, but we're not there yet, right? So this is speaking directly to us today. Okay. 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 Uh, ver uh, point four there in your handouts if you're following along, all right? The servants were not given an equal sum. However, they were given more money than they could have ever imagined. In our modern Western thinking, it can be so easy to jump to the master didn't invest in each of them the same, and that bothers us, right? Let's just be real. That bothers us because, because we, we live so much, you know, we live so much in a culture of like that equality is the most important thing that can happen. In fact, even me saying this, right, there's this, this part that I've been raised where that the primary, the, the ultimate source of good in the world must be equality. And therefore, there's a part of us that hates inequality in any form. And we have to be careful because, listen, I don't know about you, but Human beings, no more than what we are born into, is ever equal, right? Equality does not exist in the real world. You know what I mean? You can't tell me that somebody living near an active volcano, okay, and me here in Brick Township, New Jersey, are having an equal lifestyle, right? There are different things we have to be aware of, right? There is no such thing as equality. So the Lord here, right, the master has given them different amounts, right? And it says according to their ability. Again, we can almost get like a subtle sense of like offense at that. Like, well, that's not fair. I don't like it. Hold on. <laughs> they were not given an equal sum. They were given an unimaginably more money than they could have ever pictured, right? They were giving more than they could have ever imagined. All right, verse 16, we're going to continue on. Then he would receive five talents, went and traded with them, and made another five talents. Again, he's now sitting on $15 million. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, okay. And likewise, he would receive two talents, gained two more uh, also. But he would receive one talent, went, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. I love in the, uh, in the like, King James Version, it says, came to have a reckoning. <laughs> kind of a very epic moment there, right? He came, the Lord had returned. Now, just so you know, it was normal. If you were like this kind of wealthy, right, Elon Musk levels of wealthy in the first century, um, it was normal to go on these huge, long journeys because you would normally be establishing trade routes or uh, partnerships with people from long distances. You would be um, working at trying to expand the family business, whatever it might have been. So this was normal, and what would happen is if you were a servant in the first century and your master had entrusted you with his household, the one thing you would want to happen, if you were not a good servant, was that the master has like some kind of horrible shipwreck while he's out, right? Because then who has all the goods, right? He only gave me five talents. I didn't invest those like and gain another five for myself, right? Like that was, you would want the master to not come back. 
right? If you're in first century world, that was common. And if there was no like, like uh, relatives or inheritance that was going to be given, the servants, the prime servants, those who took care of the household were generally the ones who inherited their master's wealth, right? So they're here and they're doing the work, right? The one of five, who gains five talents gains five more, more. The one with two talents gains two more. The one that had one went and hid his master's money. So we're going to pick up here at verse 20. <sighs> I'm getting out of breath. Okay. So he who had received five talents came and brought the other five, saying, Lord, you have delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. And he says, enter into the joy of your Lord. Likewise, he says the same thing to the guy who had received two talents. You have been faithful over few things. You will be made master over many things. He says, enter into the joy of your Lord. I want you to pause right there because there's a point here. There's a, there's a truth here that we need to grasp that's so important. And it, it counteracts that when I talk about our, our, our Western mentality of the need for equality, it counteracts it. And here's what it is. Because God's equality is not the same as your and my equality, right? God does, not, God does not hold value to things like you and I hold value to, right? He doesn't. It's not the same. From, the, from God's heavenly perspective, what, what he departed to us, what he's given to us, the talents he has entrusted to you and I, do not hold the same value as we value them, right? Because if he did, he would have rewarded them differently. But look what it says, right? Despite, this is point five in your hand, in your uh, fill-ins, by the way. Despite the inequality of what was given to them, the first two servants received an equal reward. Do you hear that? Despite that they were not entrusted with the same amount of money, right? Millions of dollars difference between the two, they received an equal reward, right? That is God's picture of equality, right? It's different from our perspective of equality because God does not value the things that you and I value the way you and I value them, Amen. right? Amen? Um, also, I want you to get this here, right? That look at the picture of the five talents, the two talents, right? The ruler referred to each of their return as little. Did you notice that? Right? You have been faithful over little. That's what the word says. Some things say you've been faithful over a few things. <laughs> I don't know about you, but <laughs> if I was working with $15 million after a year with, of investment, I would not consider that some small amount of money. Why is the master referring to it as something small? Because to the master, it's not about the money. This is all about the servants from his perspective. This is all about his servants. All right, continuing on. This is kind of tell you, this is the part I like the least about this parable. In fact, when I first read this, I was like a teenager. I hated this part because I identify with the third servant. In fact, I, there have been so many times in life where I've been paralyzed by fear that I'm like, God, this is not a loving response to people who are going through stuff. Right? I don't like this part of the parable when I read it, especially as a younger, younger man. Verse 24, then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, here is what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Can I tell you, I don't like that. Because I read the Bible, I'm like, God is love, right? He tells me that. He's rich in mercy. He's full of grace. He's full of kindness. He's slow to anger, right? That he, is, he blesses every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. That's what I read when I read the Bible. And then I read this thing. I'm like, that's, why, why is that there? Let's just be real. Have you ever wondered why is that there, right? I don't like that. I don't like that it's in there. It doesn't make sense. Just so you know, when he says, you wicked and lazy servant, um, right there in your, your fill-ins, you have like two little bullet points, wicked and lazy. If you want, you can kind of fill in. There's additional definitions or meanings for the words used in the Greek, okay? Now, I am not even going to attempt to pronounce these in Greek because it's all Greek to me. <laughs> uh, okay, um, 
right? Wicked, that word wicked also means derelict. Derelict. It's uh, the same word, like a derelict is um, many times, and this is even, this is a reality today, sometimes ships are going down or about to go down in the ocean, and so the crew will abandon them. But it turns out the ship doesn't actually sink. It just kind of floats now on uncrewed, right? It's referred to as a derelict, right? It's a ghost ship. Nobody's there. It's just kind of floating, going wherever the tides take it, right? It also means like it, that picture is like devoid of morality, just like a, a ship would be devoid of a crew, devoid of morality. And that word lazy, right? Let's face it, we've all been a little lazy at some point in life. We have. It's true. It's human nature. We've all sat there at three o'clock in the morning eating Cheetos, watching like workout videos. <laughs> Good. It's not just me. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure we're in this together, um, right? That word lazy means, it, it means both slothful. It also means irksome. Everybody say irksome. Have you ever been irked by something, right? Like you're standing in line at the Wawa and somebody's like trying to pay an exact change for his $2.17 coffee. Hi, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. If you know, you know. Okay. Right? Um, what else is irksome, right? When you're driving down the parkway, right? And everybody's going like 80, which is the relational speed limit. And it's not the real speed limit, but and then there's that one person who's like going the speed limit, right? And we all want to pretend that we're saved in that moment, but we all know we fly by that person and we give them the look, <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about, right? You fly by that person and they need to know that they did it wrong, right? So you're going by and you're like, you know, the longer you hold that stare, the more they need to know. Amen. You with me? We're in this together. This is just a human. You wouldn't want to admit to it, but it's true, right? We've all done that. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Can I tell you? Sometimes I can't tell you how many times it's been done to me. Like I said, hi, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. Um, right? Sometimes I'm the guy going under the speed limit on the parkway. And if it's me, just pray for me, okay? Um, I know. Right, wicked and lazy, right? That there is this devoid of morality and irksome, so slow to action that it is painful, right? Um, I can remember being a teenager. My parents wanted me to do the dishes, and like I was going to do the dishes, but very slow pace, right? We don't, for the record, at Cutting Edge Youth Ministries, we don't teach that kind of obedience, okay? Amen. Um, all right, so, right, that there's, this, there's, there's this picture of laziness and devoid of morality. This is the picture, right? Again, I still don't like this, but let, understand, right? This, listen to the master's response here. We're continuing on verse 26. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, right? That means I gathered, I gathered a harvest from crops I didn't myself try and plant, uh, and gathered where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. And then he says something I really don't like. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. Can I tell you, point number six in here. This is where it sums up. Why, why, is, why is this such a severe reaction from the master? Right? If we just talked about how it's not about the money, why is there such a severe reaction? Look at this. The reality is that the, the master, the third servant, says, claims to have known. In fact, that word known also means to perceive in the Greek. That master, that the third servant says, I knew you to be a hard man, is not the master that the parable describes. Right? Because the parable describes a master who is entrusting huge amounts of wealth to his servants, to the people who are supposed to take care of things in his absence. Right? He is one, he is the immense amount of trust. And here we see like a reality that the, the, the standard was not, you see, the first two servants doubled their investment. And so we can think, well, God wanted him to come back with one and a half million dollars later, you know, have more money. But the standard was not to go and, and, and be the, the, the perfect, you know, investor of the planet, right? The, the intent was that even if he just took what his master gave him and did the best that he knew, that that would have been acceptable. In fact, the reality is when you look at the language here, it's referring that even had he just left it with the bankers because he didn't know what to do with the money, his reward would have been the same as the first two servants. 
he's wicked and lazy, not because he wasn't good at investing money, okay? He's wicked and lazy because he didn't know who his master was. And when his master invested into him, he rejected it. That's what makes him wicked and lazy. It's not that he wasn't able, it's that he rejected his master, right? He was no servant at all because that's not what a servant does, right? Um, I heard uh, one of my, my, a mentor of mine said a phrase that stuck with me early on when I was like first setting out like my ministry life, right? And they said that to the infinite, all finites are equal. To the infinite God, all our finites are equal. Right? That means that, that God being the big, powerful God who just speaks creation with words, generates light with his voice, is the same God who is like equally capable of like, like healing your headache as well as like saving you from like earth-shattering tragedy and, and chaos, right? Same God. When God looks at your situations, right, because let's face it, we pray differently about different things. You know what I mean? When we go to God, we pray. Our prayers are different depending on what's going on in life. You know, there's a, there's a difference in intensity with our prayer, right? But to God, one thing is not more difficult to fix than another, right? Gideon's out there just being like, Lord, I need an extra day. God's like, cool. Right? Like, that's, I'll just hold the sun in the sky. No problem. All the other things that earth needs to do with the sun in the sky, I got it. It's fine. Right? Like, that's, God, it's not, it's not more difficult to God. We think we have to think it out for God. We don't, Right? The master was not interested in the money he would return from his investment. He was interested in his servants. And look at what, right, we we talk about. He doesn't, he didn't want, the master didn't want to come back and have more money. The master wanted servants to rule with him, right? We look at the return and see that the master, it, it ends with, right, the master says, enter into the joy of your Lord to the first two servants. But look what it says right before that. He says, um, you've been faithful over little, right? We talked about that. I shall make you ruler over much. The point of the master's investment was not that they all do excellent with everything. It's that he would have his servants to rule with him. That's the image of the master, right? It is one who so wants to do this with you. It's not a relationship that he has with money. It's the fact that God wants to have a relationship with you. You are the investment. God wants to do this with you. He wants to rule and reign with you. You're his prize. That's the point of this. Right? God is not looking for you to be the best anything. I hope you are. Listen, I hope if you, if, God, if you're like a figure skater at heart, I hope you become the gold medalist of the next Olympics, okay? If you are like, if you, if God's put it on you to be whatever, you know, I, I, my prayer is that you becoming everything and the world's best at it. But you don't have to be the best and most excellent at all the things. What we need to be is faithful, right? He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Can I tell you, we, some of us would, might shake the world with what God has put in you, the gift and talents and the abilities, the ideas, the dreams that God has put in you. You might shake the world. Can I tell you what shakes the world every day? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Every day, faithfulness shakes the world. You're here and I'm here because somebody was faithful. Do you know that? Yeah, somebody was faithful. Pastor Jim was faithful to me when I had to talk about my issues with girls don't like me. You know what I mean? I had no game, okay, right? Pastor Jim was faithful to talk me through that process, right? Somebody, we're here because, because pastors Walt and Marine were faithful to hold a prayer study, right? Uh, we're, you're here because somebody was faithful, right? The lights are on, and this is going out, and you're watching online if you're watching online because somebody was faithful to give, because somebody was faithful to pray. Somebody was faithful to say, God, what is it you want from me? What do I do with the blessing and the gifts that you've put in me? And some of you don't feel, listen, sometimes we're like, God, I got nothing, I tell you that's okay, because you still have Jesus, right? And that's where this last part, verse 29 here, right, comes in. We're coming for a landing here. In fact, um, I'm going to have JL come up and and play on the keys for me here, because you don't want me to go and play on the keys, because that wouldn't set the mood. Um, 
verse 29, for everyone who has, and again, this is one of those where I'm like, God, why, why is that here? Why, why is this one of the last things Jesus chooses to share before he goes to the Last Supper and then following to the cross, right? Why is this one of the last things he's wrapping up this parable with? Why this? Verse 29, for everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. I like that. It's a good verse. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. I don't like that. Then verse 30, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. That stinks. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's rough. I don't like that last part. It doesn't always make sense. Can I tell you, here's why it does make sense. Because we're not talking about money. This whole thing, can I tell you, we are, we, our mind comes back to the amount of money, the money, the money, the investment, the investment, the investment, when God is looking at the heart. How is it that you can, what you have, you will get more of it? How can you have nothing and even what you have taken away? That doesn't make any sense. That's a, that's a dichotomy. Because here's why. When you have Jesus, you have the full investment of God into your life. When you have Jesus, the full investment of heaven is given to you. When we put our faith in Jesus, the full investment is poured out onto you and entrusted to you. And when Jesus returns, when God returns to establish his kingdom, the question is not, did you use your bank account well? The question is, what did you do with his son? That's the investment. Amen? And if we don't have Jesus, even what we have doesn't matter. If without Jesus, it doesn't matter if we're, we're sitting pretty on the millions. If we're sitting there being secret billionaires, if you invested in Bitcoin when it was two cents a piece, right? It doesn't matter because it all goes away. Even what we have won't make a difference if we don't have Jesus, right? The question is not were the servants good or bad. The question is not were the servants, you know, good investors or talented or, or good at, at working. The question is, did they have a relationship with their master? Do we have a relationship with our master? Listen, quick question for us in the audience here. <laughs> quick question for myself. I have to ask myself every day, sometimes multiple times a day, depending on what's going on in the world. Oh my God. Do I trust you? Do I really trust him? Am I surrendered to him? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Are we really His? Or is our perception of God so skewed that when we look at the world around us, we're like, well, it makes sense because don't you know, I knew God to be a hard master who sowed where He did not reap and reap where He did not sow, right? Is that the response or is our response saying, God, I know who you are and I'm going to trust you even when storms rage? You know what's interesting? Noah in the Bible, not my Noah, Noah in the Bible, experienced the same rains the rest of the world did. Noah got wet. It rained. And everything he had outside of that ark was washed away. But within moments, he went from being the laughing stock of the world to being the wealthiest, richest man on earth. Because he was it. Right? He experienced the rain with everybody else, but he didn't experience the rain like everybody else. When we have Jesus, we're going to go through storms in life. We're going to, things are going to happen that shouldn't have happened. We're going to go through things that shouldn't have gone through. The question is not going to be, man, did we handle it all perfectly? The question is going to be, did we trust Jesus through the process? Did we know who our master was? Or have we, like the foolish servant, gone and buried the gift of Jesus away? hoping that it'll be the perfect ticket on his return. That's not how this works. So many times Jesus said the kingdom of heaven has come near you in the Old Testament when he's ministering. After Jesus' death on the cross, we can now say the kingdom of heaven has now come into us. 
Because when we entrust our life to Jesus, when we step into that relationship with the living God, he comes into us. It's all about relationship. It's not about the money. It's not about what you did yesterday or last night or last year. It's not about that thing that keeps you up at night that you think, man, I was so dumb. It's not about any of those things. God's not looking at those things to determine what he wants to do with your future. God's looking at the deposit of his son in your life and saying, will you just walk out life with Jesus? It's fitting that right after this, Jesus goes and they have communion together. They have the last, the last supper takes place. And Jesus wraps up like one perfect analogy, all these, these parables he's been sharing up until this point and pointing out that his blood is about to be spilled for a new covenant and his body is about to be broken for our healing. And he offers the cup to the disciples and he tells them, this is my blood poured out for you. He offers the bread, this is my body broken for you. It is the perfect moment for them to enter into that next step of relationship with their Lord and knowing who he was. That's why we do this today, because he says, often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Why are we doing it in remembrance of him? Because we need to remember that our master is returning. It's soon at hand. And the question is not going to be, did you clean your shoes? Did you make your bed? I hope you do, but that's not it. The question is, what did you do with my son? This parable echoes two parables before it. I said that in the beginning. That's what it does. That's what it did. The one is the parable of the wicked servant. Two episodes before this, two episodes, two parables before this, where the wicked servant treats his fellow servants poorly, and upon his master's return, he's cast out into weeping and gnashing of teeth like this servant. It also echoes the picture of the, the ten virgins, the five that were wise and the five that were foolish. And the five that were foolish tried to come into the, the, the wedding feast of the groom, and there was, the door was shut, and the master says, I do not know you. All these talk about relationship. So as we're preparing to take communion together, I want to invite you, listen, today, let's take inventory between us and the Lord. Where's your relationship at with God? Is God the, the, the lucky rabbit's foot that you rub when you need to say a prayer every now and again? Is your relationship with God one where you're just, it, only when things are bad, you want to go and knock on heaven's door to bother him? Or is your relationship with God one where you're totally surrendered? There's just nothing held back. Everything that you have is his because he wants everything that he has to be yours. That's the relationship God wants with you today. And listen, maybe you're here and you're like, I, you don't understand, Pastor Nate. Too much has happened. I've gone too far. Too many bad things have happened in life. I've done too much wrong. Can I tell you, there is nothing that you have done that has ever scared God. And there's nothing that you could have ever made a mistake with that Jesus cannot come and get you, right? You, maybe, you're that, maybe you're that servant, you're saying, man, it's been my, the gift of God in my life has been buried for so long, I can't even imagine going and get it because it's too late. Can I tell you? You go into that gift that God has given you, you go into the gift of Jesus in your life and saying, God, I'm dusting this off for a fresh time, fresh and anew. And if Jesus were to return tomorrow, you get the same inheritance that like Billy Graham gets. Because it's not about Billy Graham. It's not about your gifts and your talents. It's about Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm so excited. But can I tell you, a fresh and anew as we take communion here together, let's evaluate. Where's our relationship at with Jesus? Do I trust him, his sacrifice, his blood, the brokenness of him on the cross for my healing and forgiveness of my sins? Or is he just that guy I go to every once in a while? Is, he, is, is, is his house the place I visit once a week and think that that's good enough? Am I his and is he mine is the question we all need to ask. And we need to ask that relentlessly until the power of God is poured out in our lives or we go, out to, we go home to see him for face to face. That's the question we all have to ask ourselves when we come to the moment of communion. Do I commune? Am I in communication? Am I in relationship with Jesus? 
So I encourage you, if, if, they, if you're here and you're saying, no, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Listen, I want you to, uh, after we close service, I want you to come right forward because today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to introduce, to be introduced to Jesus for the first time. And if you're here and you're saying, man, it's been a long time, <laughs> this is the first time in a long time, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, Lord, I need something. I need you. I need, I need you to be in my life. Then listen, as we take communion, you make this, this moment today the first declaration that God, I'm fresh and anew, I'm yours. Because he's not interested in what you have. He's just interested in you. So, hey, would you uh, open your elements if you haven't already? I'm just going to pray, and we're going to receive these together, and then I'm going to close us out in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just, uh, we thank you that we get to come into communion with you, that we enter, get to enter into relationship with the Most High God. God, thank you that of all the craziness in the world that your greatest desire is to personally know us and have us know you. So Lord, as we receive communion here, we thank you, Father, for your sacrifice on the cross, for your blood poured out for a new covenant, for the remission of our sin where we missed it. We thank you that, God, you have a plan and a purpose for us today. And we give you glory for it in the name of Jesus.